This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Well, this morning I want to share yet another message with you from the Old Testament. Uh, I think for the last four weeks now we've been in the Old Testament, and that's a little bit unusual for this preacher anyway, Uh, but it seems like those are the messages that the Lord just keeps laying on my heart. So we'll be in the Old Testament again this morning. Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel chapter number 5. 2 Samuel chapter number 5. A little bit of an introduction, of course, uh, the book of 2 Samuel is one of those books of history that are recorded for us in the Old Testament, and uh, the things that we're going to see today have to do with the life of King David. David is one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament, and I think uh, some of you as well from having listened to you. Uh, David is a man that I think a lot of us can relate to. He was a man that loved God. He had his faults, he had his weaknesses, he had his sins that he committed. But at the end of the day, the Bible says in the New Testament that David was a man after God's own heart. I think all of us ought to aspire to be men and women after God's own heart. But I want to share with you a story from the life of David that is maybe a story that you're not familiar with. But I think it shows us a lot not only about David but about the God that David serves. So if you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word as I read our text this morning, and I'm going to begin reading in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17 through the end of the chapter. Here's what it says. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hold. And the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Baal Perizim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Bel perizim And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees." And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so, as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. I want to direct your attention back, if I could, to verse number 18. It says, the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. The name Rephaim is a direct reference to the giants of the Old Testament. The Rephaim were one of the names that were given to the giants in the land of Canaan at the time that the children of Israel went in to possess the land. I want to bring a message to you this morning entitled, The Valley of the Giants. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you take the reading of your word and allow it to speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, those who need peace, I pray you'd give them peace. Those who need conviction, I pray you'd bring conviction to their hearts this morning. All for the purpose that we might each bring honor and glory to you with our lives. And I pray that when we leave this place, all of us, Lord, might... Dear God, that we might give glory to You. Whatever's going on in our lives, whatever's in the past, I pray we give You the victory 
and the glory this morning. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Valley of the Giants. The setting here for this particular story this morning is the occasion when David is anointed king over all Israel. Now, as you know, David had already been anointed by the prophet Samuel when he was younger, and God had said, this will be the future king of Israel. But this is the occasion when David actually becomes the king of Israel. He was anointed by the people of Israel at Hebron, Mount Hebron. And uh, Mount Hebron itself has a a history that's related to the giants of the Old Testament. In fact, one of my uh, favorite stories in the Old Testament, I've preached a message on it before, is about Mount Hebron. When the children of Israel came in to possess the land, Mount Hebron was the part of the land that Caleb chose for his own. You remember God had told Joshua and Caleb that because they were the only two spies that went into the land 40 years earlier and brought back a good report that not only was the land good and overflowing with milk and honey, but that God would help them take the land. God told Moses to tell Joshua and Caleb that the two of them could pick whatever parcel of ground in all the promised land they wanted for themselves. Well, when the day finally came, 40 years later, and they crossed over the Jordan River, Caleb reminded Joshua what God had told Moses, and he said, Joshua, that's the mountain. He said, I want that mountain. In fact, there's a hymn in our hymn book that says, I want that mountain. Caleb pointed to Mount Hebron, and he said, I want that mountain. But the only thing about Mount Hebron is that it was a mountain possessed by giants. The Anakim lived up on top of uh, Mount Hebron, and uh, the, the father was Anak, and the sons of Anak, lived up on top of Mount Hebron. We don't know exactly how tall these giants were that lived on Mount Hebron, but they were giants. We know that Joshua and Caleb and the other uh, children of Israel that spied out the land 40 years earlier, when they came back and gave a report to the people of Israel, they said, we were as grasshoppers in their sight, and we viewed ourselves as grasshoppers in their sight. These were giants of men. And yet Caleb and his boys charged up Mount Hebron and took the mountain, and that became the possession for Caleb and his family for generations after that. So Mount Hebron had a history of being related to giants in the Old Testament. But this entire valley that we read about here is known as the Valley of the Rephaim, the Valley of the Giants. It was one of the most lush, bountiful places in all of the land of Canaan. Little surprise that the giants would choose it for their own when they were there because they took the best, because they were the biggest, and they could take whatever they wanted. For generations before the children of Israel had gone in and possessed the land, the giants and the descendants of the giants lived in and around this valley that went from southern Israel near Mount Hebron all the way to the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. As you're looking at it, the valley would have gone this direction. Almost all the way across the southern part of Israel in what is the the land of the tribe of Judah. The Valley of the Giants... It was known as the Valley of the Giants because there were numerous giants who lived there. Not just the Anakim who lived at the end of the valley up on Mount Hebron. But in the Old Testament we read about numerous giants who lived there in that valley and beyond the valley. Hold your place there if you would and turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 2. Deuteronomy, of course, is one of the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It is uh, the last of the five books written by Moses. And the book of Deuteronomy records not only the law given to Israel, but some of the history of Israel uh, before they went in to possess the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, 
beginning in verse 10, it says this of the giants. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are here this day. I'm sorry, I'm reading chapter 1, verse 10 of chapter 2. The Emims dwelt therein in times past, a great people, and many, and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. So here's another name for the giants, the Anakims and the Emims. Now, turn over one page in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter number 3 and look down to verse 11. We have not only another mention of these giants, but we have mention of one of them by name, and it even tells us a little about him. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. And this land which we possessed at that time from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites. And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants." This is talking about a portion of the land that was actually to the, uh, to the east of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. It was a land that had been inhabited by the Moabites. The giants lived there among them. These giants, one of them still was alive at the time that the children of Israel returned to the promised land and were about to enter into the promised land. These were some of the original giants. It says here that Og was the last of the remnant of giants. There were giants in the land when the children of Israel got there, but apparently these giants were bigger giants than the ones that were there when they arrived. We have the name of one of them. His name is Og, king of Bashan. And it says that his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Nine cubits was the length thereof. Now a cubit is approximately the distance from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. On most men, it averages out to approximately 18 inches, a foot and a half. This giant's bed was nine cubits. Now as I figure that out, that's about what? Close to 14 feet long. Now, the bed that you lie in, you probably go just about from one end to the other. I'm assuming that Og must have gone just about from one end of his bed to the other. And so that's a pretty tall man lying in a 14-foot bed. I think we could say that's a giant of a man. And yet the Bible says he was, of the, he was the last of the remnant of the giants. He's a 14-footer. He's the last of the really big giants. And yet we know there were giants in the land when the children of Israel got there. They just weren't quite as big a giant as the ones that had come before. Apparently there had been generations of giants just like Og who were 14 feet, maybe even taller than that. Giants of men. And this valley had a history behind it. I think we could say that to the people who lived there in the land around the giants, it was a legendary valley. There was a legend associated with the valley. That's why they called it the Valley of the Rephaim. The Valley of Giants. Because the giants inhabited the valley and they were a people 14 foot tall and some of them may be taller. Folks, any way you look at it, a 14-foot man is a big man. I think probably the tallest fellow playing in the NBA today is 7 foot tall. The tallest. This giant would have been twice the height of the tallest player in the NBA. 
That's how tall he was. Can you imagine how big he was? Quite a giant. This place among the people of the ancient times was viewed as a big man. A bunch of giants. And this valley being their home was legendary. Everyone who spoke of the valley knew immediately it's the valley of the giants. You know, the giants who lived there were not godly people. In fact, much the opposite. They were ungodly, they were wicked people. Every giant we see in the Bible was ungodly and wicked. They opposed God. And I think of the story here. Here is David, he's just been coronated, crowned the new king of Israel. And then here come all the Philistines flooding into the valley of the Rephaim, the valley of the giants, to oppose David having just been anointed king over Israel. Why did the Philistines show up? It's because they weren't happy that Israel had any king. They thought that with the death of Saul, they were done with the Israelites. They would come in and crush them because they were leaderless now that Saul and his sons were dead. In fact, the Philistines are the ones who killed Saul and his son Jonathan. And the Philistines looked for the opportunity to come in and crush the Israelites once and for all. But now David. David had been crowned king. Now it was going to be another battle. So the Philistines showed up in mass. It says all the Philistines. Not just some, but all the Philistines showed up. But they showed up, I think, in this particular valley, in part for tactical reasons, strategic reasons, because it separated Mount Hebron from Jerusalem, and it was impossible to get communications or supplies between Hebron and Jerusalem as long as they kept that valley in between. So it was a military feat for possessing the valley. But I think more than that, they were choosing the ground on which they wanted to fight David and the Israelites. They could have chosen some other place to mass their armies in the land of Israel. But where did the Philistines choose that they wanted to do battle with the people of God? They chose the valley of the giants. I think the reason or one of the reasons they chose the Valley of the Giants is because it was legendary. And not only legendary about the giants being tall who lived there, but legendary because those who had lived there and inhabited the valleys for generations opposed the God of Israel. It was an evil, wicked place at least when it was inhabited by the giants before. A place of great wickedness. Defiance against God. And that was the ground they wanted to fight Israel. What better place to fight Israel than a place where giants had defied the God of Israel, the very God of heaven. It was renowned for its wickedness. As I was thinking about this passage this week, I was thinking about my life and your life. You know, Satan has some intentional reasons for choosing the battles in my life and your life. Satan doesn't do anything without putting some thought into it. His fallen angels that you call demons or devils as the Bible calls them, they don't just run around harem scarum. They have a plan for everything they do to try to disrupt your life and my life. Before I get to that, though, another word or two about the valley. You see, it was the valley of the giants because the Rephaim had inhabited it in generations gone by. 
But even though the Bible says that Og, king of Bashan, was the last of the remnant of the giants, as I read my Bible, I know that there were other giants that were still there. They just weren't 14-footers. I read about Goliath, who was there. David, the same one who just got anointed king over Israel, met another one of those giants just years earlier in his own life in the same valley or a part of that valley. You know who he is. It's Goliath. The story of David and Goliath. Now when we read about Goliath in the Bible, in 1 Samuel 17, it tells us that Goliath was about 10 foot tall. I have a a stick that I keep in here for the kids. When we uh, were in vacation Bible school, I wanted to show them how tall Goliath was. This is right at 10 foot tall from the floor. Maybe I should come down there. Goliath. Ten foot tall. That's a tall, tall man. That's not 14 foot. That's just 10 foot. But Goliath was 10 foot tall, the Bible says. A little over nine cubits. Nine cubits and a span, I believe the Bible tells us. So, there were still giants. They just weren't as big as the original giants were that inhabited the land like Og. But there were still giants 10 foot tall. The Bible tells us also in other places in the Old Testament that Goliath had brothers who were giants. So even though there weren't any 14 foot giants perhaps at this point in time when the Philistines came, there were still 10 foot giants. And any way you want to describe it or look at it, a 10 foot man is still a giant. These Philistines that show up in the Valley of the Giants. They have some of the descendants of the giants living among them. We know that because Goliath was a Philistine. Goliath of Gath. Gath was one of the five major cities of the Philistines that are listed for us in the Old Testament. But I want to read for you in 2 Samuel, and you can turn there if you'd like to. Chapter 21 tells us about some more of the giants among the Philistines. So if you'd like to hold your place there and turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 21, you can see for yourself some of these giants. Here's what it says, beginning in chapter 21, verse 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. And Ishbibinob, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. Now it calls him here uh, one of the sons of the giant we would suppose this was probably one of Goliath's sons who had shown up to battle years after David killed Goliath. One of Goliath's sons showed up and his goal on the battlefield that day was to kill David, to get revenge for his father for all those years before. So here's David now as a grown man fighting with the son, the grown son of Goliath all those years later. He killed the one giant years ago, but lo and behold, here's another giant he's facing today. The son of the first giant that he slayed. But that's not the only giant mentioned in the passage. Look at verse 17. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him, that is, helped David, and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle that thou quench not the light of Israel. The men said, listen, they almost killed you today, King David. We don't wish for you to come to battle with us anymore. We don't want the Philistines to send their giants to kill you. Verse 18, And it came to pass after this, 
that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibabekai, the Hushethite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. There's another of Goliath's sons. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elanon, the son of Jergorim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Here's yet another giant, same family, but not one of Goliath's sons, but one of his brothers. So we've already seen Goliath, two of his sons that were giants, one of his brothers that was a giant, but we're not finished. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. There's another of Goliath's sons, but this one had six fingers on every hand and six toes on every foot. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So here we see that at the time of David, there are still giants in the land and they are living among the Philistines, just like Goliath, because they're all related to Goliath. Some of them his sons, one of them mentioned in this passage, his brother. But they're all giants. They may only have been ten foot giants, but they were still giants. And when they came with the Philistines to fight against David, now that David was the new king of Israel, it's not an accident that they chose the valley of the giants for the battle to take place. For they had with them some of the giants. Maybe not as big as the giants of days gone by, but still giants nonetheless. As I mentioned before, I was thinking this week, just as the Philistines, with their giants, related to the older giants, chose this valley as the place where they wanted to do battle with the people of God, I couldn't help but think about the fact in my life, and I'm sure in yours too, Satan chooses the places to attack because he knows me and you. And he knows his greatest sources of strength. Now I could do like Baptist preachers normally do, and I might do a little bit of that right now. There are some things in life where you and I know there are certain things that belong to the devil. There are certain places, certain people, certain activities in this world that have nothing to do with God. Satan loves to draw Christians to those places. And to do battle against the people of God in those places. Because he has the upper hand. He has the legendary strength of giants. Did you know that the first mention of music in the Bible, although there was music in the throne room of God before, the first mention of music is in relation to one of the descendants of Cain. In the Old Testament. The ungodly line of Cain. Just as music can be used for God. As you heard beautifully sung this morning in our special. Music so too can be used of Satan. And it is a powerful tool. I've said this before in the past. But uh, it's been a while so maybe I should say it again. Music is dangerous because music bypasses this and goes straight to this. Music plays upon not your intellect, 
but upon your emotions. It's the reason that the country music bands get up and they sing their songs and they'll have you boohooing in your beer. It's the reason that the jungle music that's played on the radio has people up taking off their clothes and jumping around like someone from the darkest continent of Africa. It doesn't affect this. It bypasses your intellect and appeals directly to the flesh and to the emotions. It makes your body do things beyond your control and makes you feel things without you choosing to feel them. When I was a teenager, there was a man who helped our, uh, in the youth group. He wasn't the youth pastor, but he helped at a lot of the activities. <coughs> Excuse me. He's a wonderful man of God. And he gave a testimony to us when we were teenagers that before he got saved, he used to sing in nightclubs. And he said, before we would get up to play, we would just go ahead and decide for fun how we wanted to take the crowd through the evening. He said, depending on what we played and how we played it, we could either have them all standing out there sobbing and crying or we could have them dancing and having a good time. We could totally control their mood, their emotions, by the music we played and how we played it. Now folks, that's someone who used to do that for a living, saying that, admitting that. You and I ought to be very careful of the music we listen to. And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter what type of music you listen to, if you listen to music that's not honoring and glorifying God, it'll affect your heart and your flesh. If I did what most independent Baptist preachers do, I'd just start naming some names, but I'm not going to do that in part because whatever names are really important to you already came to your mind. And in part because the preacher doesn't know the latest and greatest groups today. But I do know that music affects all of us. And if a Christian is listening to the wrong kind of music, it will destroy your Christian life. It will keep you from being what God wants you to be. One of the things my youth pastor used to say, he said, you let me go sit in your car with you and turn your radio on and see what kind of music you've been listening to and I can tell you where you're at with God. And as a teenager, I can remember being totally repulsed that he would say that. Totally offended. And every other teenager sitting up there in that room, upstairs that Wednesday night that he said it, was offended that he would say that. To think that he could say what my relationship is like with God based on what I've been listening to on the radio. But can I tell you, as I've gotten older, I've realized he was exactly right. The preacher has no desire to go sit in your car or in your house and see what you've been listening to. But I can tell you, whatever you've been listening to, God already knows what you've been listening to. It's not the preacher's business. But it is the preacher's job to say, what have you been listening to? I have to think that music is one of those places that's akin to the Valley of the Giants. It's where the enemy likes to do battle. Because he usually comes out on top if he can get you in the valley where he wants you. Another one is Hollywood, the things we watch. Well, the preacher's preaching on rock music and Hollywood and folks, I'm just saying the same things that preachers have been saying before those things existed. The things that appeal to our flesh are the places Satan wants to get us. It does, it's not just rock music. There's enough country music with bad stuff too. Rap, hip-hop, and all the other jungle music. 
But Hollywood has its own share of stuff. And if we're not careful of the things we put in through our eyes, it will affect our heart. Proverbs says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What are you putting into your heart? I couldn't help but think that the Philistines chose the valley of the giants as the battleground of their choosing because they knew the legends of the valley of the giants. A place of great wickedness against God. But that's not the end of the story. Thankfully, we have the rest of the story that we read in our text this morning. And it says that David prayed and said, Lord, should I go out and fight the Philistines? And God said, go out and fight them. For victory is yours. And David went out with the men of Israel. They waged battle against these Philistines, including their giants, in the valley of giants. And God gave them great victory. And the reason that God gave them victory was because they were obedient to God. I love what it says in verse 21 in our original text. After they had defeated the enemy, it says, and there they left their images. That's the Philistines. There they left their images, and David and his men burned them. You know what the images are they're talking about? The images of their gods. They left statues, pictures, drawings, wreaths, Whatever they had to depict their false gods, they're in the camp because they ran away in such haste. David and his men came in, found all those trinkets that had to do with the false gods of the Philistines, and they wisely burned them. Everything. Burned them all. And yet Christians have less sense... And Christians find something of the world and say, Oh, how neat. Let me play with it for a while. You can get upset with the preacher this morning if you want to, but it's what happens in too many Christians' lives. They find something that belongs to the world and instead of burning it, getting away from it, having nothing to do with it, they say, Let me play with this for a while and investigate it. Let me see what's so fascinating about this thing to the world. Again, I don't have to name anything because whatever it applies to in my life has already come to my mind. Whatever it applies to in your life that you shouldn't be having anything to do with, it already came to your mind, I'm sure. They had enough sense to burn the things of Satan and have nothing to do with them. We ought to do the same. I know Baptists are notorious for having book burnings and album burnings. Back in the 70's, uh, there were lots of independent Baptist churches that would encourage all the people to come, bring all their rock music, make a big pile and have a bonfire. And folks, I don't necessarily think we need to have a bonfire, but if we need to have a bonfire, there's a place out back where we can have a bonfire. But we ought not need to have a, a church-wide bonfire because you ought to go home and whatever it is that's causing you a problem in your life, you ought to get rid of it yourself. And the preacher ought to get rid of whatever's causing him problems. Whether it be things, music, movies, or people. If it's causing you a problem in your relationship and your service to God, you ought to go home and get rid of it. If you need some help, we'll have the bonfire. It's biblical, by the way, because they had one in the book of Acts. We just hadn't come up on it yet in our study in the book of Acts. But it's biblical. And if we need to have one, we'll have one. But you and I ought to examine our lives, our hearts, Find what is it in our, our lives that ought not be there. And we need to stop playing with the things of the world and set them on fire. Last thing I'll say, and I'm done. David 
renamed this place. It was known as the Valley of the Giants because of those named after those wicked giants. Well, at least one place in that valley was never again known as the Valley of Giants. This one place where the battle took place got renamed that day. David renamed the place. Look at verse 20. David came to Baal Perizim, and David smote them there and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perizim. David named the, the place Baal Perizim. You say, well, the name Baal, that's a, that's a false god. Yeah, but the word Baal simply means Lord. The name Baal Perizim means Lord of the Breakthrough. Because he said, there that day, God broke forth on the Philistines like water breaking forth through a dam. Have you ever seen a dam that started crumbling? You've seen videos of one start to give way and then the waters just gush through? You've seen videos of a dam breaking, giving way. He said that's what God did that day for Israel with the enemies of Israel. He said that that day God broke forth like the waters upon their enemies. Can I tell you that God wants to break through in your life too? God wants to show Himself strong on your behalf, just like He did for Israel that day. But it means, number one, fighting the fight. Number two, burning the images of the enemy and not carrying them home with us. If we'll be faithful to God, take the stands we ought to take. Love God. Listen to Him. Follow His Word and obey Him. We will see breakthroughs in our lives too. Oh preacher, I've been needing a breakthrough spiritually in my life for the longest. Dear friends, have you done what David did that day? Are you still not totally following God's Word? This is our copy. Or are you still playing with some of the knickknacks and play pretties of the devil's crowd instead of getting rid of them and getting them out of your life, out of your house, out of the car. If you want to see a breakthrough spiritually in your life, we have to do like David did that day. Follow God's Word wherever it leads us. Do battle with the enemy wherever we find him and burn the things that ought to be burned and left behind. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Heads bowed and eyes closed as those who are going to help with the invitation come at this time, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you take this invitation I pray that You'd use it for Your honor and Your glory. Dear Heavenly Father, help us, I pray. Those that are saved that are here this morning, I pray, help us to want You to be truly the Lord of our lives. Not just in saving us, but in the way we live. I pray that You would, Lord, help us to strive to be what You want us to be. individually and as families and as a church. I pray too, dear God, that You would help us to put those things out of our lives that ought not be there. Then Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know for sure that they're saved, oh dear God, Your grace is so amazing that you'd be willing to save anyone if they'd come to you in repentance. Dear God, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning that's not certain of their salvation, that you'd give them the faith and courage to come at invitation time. Take the preacher by the hand and say, Preacher, I want to make sure I'm saved. And with heads still bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, in a moment we're about to have an invitational hymn. 
as soon as the music begins to play and Kim begins to sing, if God has spoken to your heart this morning, if there's something you need to put out of your life or leave behind or burn, literally or figuratively or practically, would you just come kneel and get along with God at the altar and say, Lord, I'm leaving it here at the altar. If you're not following what you know God wants you to do, maybe you'd want to just come kneel and pray and say, God, I haven't been following you like I should, but I want to, Lord. The altar is open. If you're not sure you're saved, would you please take the preacher by the hand and say, Preacher, I need to make sure I'm saved. If you need to join a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, come shake my hand and tell me that too. Let me know why you're coming. Lord, I pray you'd use this invitation for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.